talking to you right now. What's up, kids? How y'all doing? I, um, I bring you greetings from Glendale Seventh-day Adventist Church in California, where I serve as the associate. And as was read, I'm the senior pastor over at Maricopa Village Indian Community Church down on the res. Um, I got to tell you that I got the greatest job in the world. I get to talk about Jesus and get paid for it. I love what I do. And I really enjoy working with kids. I really enjoy working with young people, young adults. Um, I've been getting phone calls all week since I've been here. You're not in your office. Where are you? I'm coming back. I promise. You need to Zoom. You need to talk. Because I really, really try to invest in these kids. I want to tell you about Atholton. And I've been getting this wrong ever since they asked me to come. I've called it Athleton, Athloton. I'm so glad I got out here and got the pronunciation right. Athelton, correct? Athelton, all right. Because, <coughs> excuse me, people have been asking me, where are you going? Man, I don't know, I say it wrong every time. Uh, but I praise the Lord for this staff, I praise the Lord for this school. If you didn't know, and you have not been in this campus, and you have not been here, just let me give you a plug. Um, there is more ministry happening in this school every day than in this church on the weekends. I promise you that. You have a great staff and some great students. And I don't say that just for fluff. I taught for nine years. Um, when I first came into Glenview Academy, we were 86 kids and needed to let go of a teacher, and I was going to be it. I was the low man on the totem pole, and we've been able to grow that. We're not quite at what Athelton is at, but we're able to grow, and we're still standing strong. Um, I serve as the chaplain at two schools. Maricopa Village, uh, a, a Christian school, and at Glenview Academy, and I get to work with our young people all the time, and it is the greatest joy of my life. I, well, hold on, hold on. Being a dad is the greatest joy of my life, then working with kids. Got to get that straight. Um, so I bring you greetings from all of these places in Arizona. Then as a turner, just for my family, hi, Mom. I know she's watching. Um, I am so, so very grateful for the acceptance, for, the, for bringing me out, and for the fellowship here. I've had a great time with your teachers, a great time with your parents um, that have been here. And, so, and your pastor here has been just Johnny on the spot. And this guy's a nut job, so just trying to follow him. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Mr. Do Everything, I like him. He is, he is the consummate pathfinder. I can see it in him every day, so I appreciate it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, my prayer never changes. It is your time. This is your place. These are your people, and this is your day. I am just a tool in your belt, God, to be used by you. So, Father, I ask you today to use me as you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pray that way ever since I started speaking because, oh, how can I say this lightly? I didn't ask for this job. I wanted to go be a ball player. I wanted to go do something else. I wanted to make money. You like that? I wanted to make money. Um, I didn't ask to do this, but... Uh, I've known that God wanted me to come this way for a while. I ran from it for as long as I could. But when I give names to God that I use in my home, not in public, uh, they're for a reason. Like at home, I call God Dad. Here, I will call him by his title. At home, when I'm praying, I will call God the greatest stalker that ever lived. I will not call him that from a pulpit, but let me tell you, when you try to run from God, your legs aren't fast enough, they ain't long enough, and you ain't big enough. And when he corners you, it is like a hunter finding his prey and saying, now what? And you have no choice but to answer the call of the Almighty. I answered the call after 10 years of running and he put me back in position. I was, at, <laughs> I was at the executive committee meeting where they 
asked me to step outside so they could take the vote to make me a pastor. And I was ordained three years ago, and I had been working as a pastor for five years before that. I love this job. I never thought I would. I didn't want the responsibility. I didn't want people calling me at two o'clock in the morning. I didn't want to deal with you. I tried to figure out a way to say it politely. I couldn't. I didn't want to deal with you. But God has been so good, and I praise God that he knows me better than I know me. Today I want to talk to you about faith. And it's important that we have this discussion because there are certain things in the Bible that I didn't know I could do until I read it. And it's amazing what you find out when you open up this book and actually read what you can do. I'll give you a prime example. I shared this with the kids a little bit. Um, Job is found in the Bible, first chapter, very beginning, praying for the sins of his children. I didn't know I could do that. Pastor Mark, I didn't know I could pray to ask God to forgive the sins of other people. I know that he would if they asked. I know that I was trying to help me forgive them for what they did, because I wanted to, woo. But I did not know that I could ask God for forgiveness for somebody else's issues. And how do we know that that prayer was legitimate? Because when God gave Job double of everything that he lost from the enemy taking it from him, he only gave him 10 kids back. What was that telling Job? Your other 10 kids, I got them. And you will see them again you got your 20. I did not know that you could pray for the sins of others. Maybe you knew, I didn't, until I read that story. I did not know that I could ask God to send fire down from heaven and destroy my enemies. The disciples and Jesus were walking, Jesus wasn't getting led into a place. The disciples' first response, you know, Peter and the boys, the Sons of Thunder, you know, the, the nicknames we have for them. We, we adults know why they have those names. They said, you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? Jesus never turned and said, you can't do that. He said, I didn't come for that. I didn't come for that. But he didn't say you couldn't do it. I'm still working on God's heart, so know when to do it. But apparently... Apparently, he didn't come for that. I didn't come where he's from, so, you know, we're working on this. We're negotiating right now. Don't you reboot on me. Fine. I didn't know that my faith was the requirement to fix what's ailing the world. One of our favorite verses, you tell me where it's from. I'm gonna say it, and I want you to tell me where it's from. Let's see who knows their Bible in here. Seek ye first. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things, all of everything. All of what things, God? All of these things. What do you want? What do you need? Okay, well that's a big list, God. I, I'm kind of going for world peace right now. Great, seek me first. I'm kind of going for family peace right now, God. Great, seek me first. I'm kind of going for house peace right now, God. Great, seek me first. I'm kind of going for heart peace right now, God. Great, seek me first. It's the same answer every time. Seek him first. And he's not talking to those out there lost. He's talking to the ones who bear his name. Let's see if you can do this again. Give me another verse. This will be a fun one. I learned this verse when I was down and out playing Christian music in my car. It's a song by Fred Hammond and the Radicals for Christ. It says, I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing, but if my people who I call by my name would humble themselves and pray, 714, If my people who I call by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I 
hear from heaven, then will I forgive their sins, and then will I heal their lands. What's the requirement? Requirement number one, you gotta be the people that are called by his name. And by the way, he didn't say, if my people who call themselves by my name. We got a lot of those. I said it, but I get to go home tomorrow, so. I get to go home tomorrow. He said, if my people who I call by my name. That denotes that Jesus knows who you are. That denotes that you have a relationship with him. That denotes that you guys are bonded somehow, some way. That denotes that there's been some work put in. Not any woman gets to call herself by my name. Not any child bears my name. My name is bestowed upon someone. My son carries my name to the point where he's Eddie the fourth. He carries the full name. My little one, Xavier, bears my name. And until a man is responsible enough to, to marry my daughter, when Jesus comes, <laughs> she bears my name. So when God says, if my people who I call by my name, that means I'm in relationship with him and he's called me by his name. And if you haven't experienced that, let's work on your relationship with Christ. If my people who I call by my name would, and this, I wish we as Christians had a little bit more of this, would humble themselves. Ooh, we can be some uppity folk. We say crazy things like, we have the truth. By definition, you're saying everybody else doesn't. That's wrong. That's wrong. You're telling me God isn't anywhere else? I grew up on both sides of the track. I grew up with an Adventist mother and a Baptist reverend father. Now trust me when I tell you, look whose church won out. Look whose truth won out. But I saw God in that other church just the same. We cannot be disrespectful when God says, my children are not all in the same flock. But when I come back, there'll be one shepherd and one flock. I will get it right when I get back. But in the meantime, you go based on what you know to be true and hold the line. And unfortunately, so often, we don't. Yes, I am a hypocrite. And so are you. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Do you do things that you know to be true, uh, you know to be wrong, and you do them anyway? Yeah, I've done it. Okay, you hypocrite, get over yourself. If you weren't a hypocrite, you wouldn't need a savior, and you ain't Jesus. So let's build our relationship with him so he can call himself, uh, call us by his name. If my people who I call by my name would humble themselves and pray. Humble themselves and pray. Seek his face. Oh, there we go again with Matthew. And turn. Uh Uh-oh. We got this repenting thing. Turn from our wicked ways. I have been arrogant enough in my younger days to be in prayer asking God for forgiveness for the thing I did while in the back of my mind planning to do it again. I ain't scared to say it. My sins don't own me anymore. I did it. I've done it. We ask for forgiveness because we got caught. We feel bad. But do we actually want to turn from them because of the consequences of our choices? We got to repent. We got to say, I don't want to do that, even though it's enjoyable, because I know that leads me to hell. We have this saying in my church in Glendale, all the world offers you 
is a few thrill rides on the way to hell. That's it. That's all it offers you. Everything the world offers you will burn. When Satan grabbed Jesus and took him to the top of the mountain, there was nothing that he could offer him that wasn't already his, and there was nothing that he could offer him that wasn't going to burn. Jesus, uh, one of my favorite content characters, (laughs) he he makes fun of the devil all the time. I love it. He he says, Jesus, if if you bow to me, I'll give you all of the world. And Jesus says, you know I made this, right? Did you think I forget that I already own this? I, I made this. I love the way he makes fun of him. It is important for us to understand the context of the story and what, what happened in here. We have to seek first the kingdom of God. We have to humble ourselves and pray. Seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. We have to grow in relationship with him. We have to grow in our faith. Now let's go back to the story. Jesus has got done calling out his disciples. He just healed a leper. His renown is growing. People are starting to flock to him. And so he comes into town and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the ones who wanted control, are now coming in to see who is this young upstart. And he's in the building preaching and teaching and the crowds are pressing in and they are hoping, waiting to catch him in any mess up. They are hoping, waiting to catch him in a lie, catch him in an untruth. They're trying to find something to catch him on. You ever sit there and talk with people and they're not really listening, they're just waiting to mess you up, waiting to catch you up? Jesus knows what they're doing and he doesn't run. And as they are pressing in on him, some friends who must have heard what Jesus has done, must have seen what Jesus has done, must have heard something, some friends get together and bring their paralyzed friend to go see the Messiah. Maybe they were there when he healed the leper. Maybe they saw, I don't know. But I know that they're the kind of friends who when they see an opportunity to help another friend, They get together and go. Sounds like Christians to me. And they go. And they carry him to Jesus. But the crowd is too thick. There's too many people. There are things in the way. There are obstacles to overcome. And instead of saying, man, we can't get to him, instead of standing on ceremony, instead of standing on pretense and possibly even breaking the law, You rip up my roof, I'm gonna find a way that you broke the law. Because I want my roof fixed. (laughs) They climb onto the roof and punch a hole in it. And I can imagine them, I can imagine them figuring out how to get up there and they get up there and they're listening for just the right spot. You know, I've seen people who have an ear and they go, oh, it's right there, I can hear it. And they dig a hole, and I imagine Jesus is right in the middle of a great lecture, and he looks up, what in my world? And somebody's digging a hole, and it's making a whole lot of noise. And so everything stops, and Jesus is looking up. And if I know Peter, he probably had his sword at the ready. What's going on? Peter's my guy, I love Peter. I'm a Peter, I love Peter. And they look down and see the face of Jesus. I'm jealous already. That's my friend and I haven't seen him yet and I can't wait. They see his face and they lower their friend down to Jesus. And here's the important part of the story that I want you to read. The Bible says in two different versions, he looked up and saw their faith. In other versions it says because of their faith. Not the man who had the issues, not the man who was having the problems, not the man who was being lowered to Jesus. It doesn't even say he looked at him yet. He looked at them and their faith. 
It's one of my favorite scenes in the show, The Chosen. My kids love that show. I do too, but I ain't gonna let you blame it on me. My kids love that show, and in the scene where he's being lowered down, Jesus looks up, the character playing Jesus looks up and looks at the people lowering their friend down, and he says something I can't wait for Jesus to tell me. He looks up and says, your faith is beautiful. Oh, to have the King of Kings look at me, Eddie Turner, a humble kid from Inglewood, California, Harbor City, a kid who could have been lost to gang violence, a kid who has done more wrong in his life than good. Jesus looks and says, Eddie, your faith is beautiful. The Bible says because of their faith, he looks at this paralyzed man and does the real healing. Your sins are forgiven. See, a lot of times as a pastor, we want people to fill our pews. That seems natural. We want that. We have criteria and we have statistics and we got numbers. Our tithe is up this year. Hey, we baptized 120 people last year or eight, you know, in some cases. We want people to fill our places, but I rarely see the metric on how many people say they're so in love with Jesus they don't know what to do with themselves. How many people say, my goodness, God is so good to me. We don't have metrics for those things. We want people to look good, smell good, be nice, at least in public. I've seen some of us at the grocery store and don't let the Costco gas line be too long. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Did I say that? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I wasn't right behind my elder. I wasn't, I wasn't right behind him. Who is he yelling at? God wants people who have no blockages, no enmity, no resistance between them and him, and he will do the rest. But when we distance ourselves from God, when we want to look the part but not be the part, when we want to play the part but not really live the part, there's a problem in here. And he can't do the things that we're asking because we have a faith issue. We say all the right things, we know all the right scriptures, but are we living it? And I hear people all the time, I pray and nothing happens, and I just look at them and smile. There's a verse that I'm gonna tell you that's gonna hurt and you're not gonna like it, but I want you to pray this verse every day. And they say, what? I'll do anything. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I want you to pray that every day until something happens. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because he is the author and finisher of our faith. And he's telling us, because of our faith, I will heal. Because of our faith, I will save. Because of our faith, I will deliver. It's our faith he's going to rely on and use. And sometimes things don't happen because, <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. It's the faith of the believers. It's the faith of the ones that are called by his name. It's the faith of us. So often we pray for people as if all of a sudden, when they get their act together, God will fix them. No, when we get our act together, God will heal the world. When we get our act together, God will deliver our children. When we get our act together, God will bring them off drugs. When we get our act together, God will handle the rest. He is looking for people who will believe. And I'm talking about some of that mm, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro belief. Did I say it? I told you I'm leaving tomorrow. I ain't got to come. You know, I, I can be in trouble for 24 hours. I'll say it. 
some of that down home belief when the king of all comes and says, I will destroy you if you don't bow down to my statue. That fire, I just made it seven times hotter. I'm gonna give you one more chance, boys. You already are slaves in my kingdom. I'm gonna give you one more chance to bow before me. And what did they say? King, I don't have to be slow in answering you. I love this. My God can save me, and he will. But even if he doesn't, that's some bad faith right there. Maybe I need some of the faith of Daniel. You know, Daniel got thrown into the lion's den because he kept praying when the king told him not to pray. But that's not even the part that gets me. I get that part. Here's the part that gets me. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Daniel was being drugged to the lion's den. Daniel was being taken kicking and screaming to the lion's den. Daniel was being taken clawing. Daniel just walked. Let's go. My God can save me. But even if he doesn't, I'm going to keep praying to him. No, you ain't got to. I will not embarrass my father. Daniel had faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had faith. What we need in our churches, what we need amongst us people who call ourselves by his name, what we need amongst us who are called by his name is an increase in faith. Do you believe that your God can do this and will do this and wants to do it? Do you know his, his word well enough to know his will? What is the will of God? It's simple. That all should come to repentance. That's his will. That none should perish. That's his will. But do we believe? And are we willing to do whatever it takes like these friends of this paralyzed man to make sure that people see Jesus? There is a atheist, renowned pen and teller, magicians, comedians, whatever you want to call them. I was most embarrassed as a follower of Christ when the big one, I don't know his name, Penn, I think that's Penn. I guess teller doesn't talk, is that right? I don't know. The big one. The big one said, the problem that he has with us Christians is that we believe a bus is coming to run the world over. He said, you believe a bus is coming to get me, but you don't love me enough to come push me out of the way. That hurt. And from that day forward, I've changed the way I do things. Am I a follower of Christ enough to see my friend who's paralyzed with fear, with doubt, with shame, with guilt, with drugs, with alcohol, with no way out, with depression. Do I love them enough? Do I love God's children enough to do whatever it takes to put them before the Messiah, trusting the Messiah to do what he does best and save? Do I love them enough to do it every time, every day? Do I love them enough to keep doing it until something changes? Do I have the faith of Daniel to pray for 21 days straight, even though I saw nothing happening? Or do I give up after a week because, you know, they just never gonna change? How do we love? And what does it have to do with our faith? The two are so intertwined. And I know this isn't a feel-good sermon. I'm challenging you right now. I'm challenging you to be different. I'm challenging you to love like there's no tomorrow. I'm challenging you to believe like there's no tomorrow. Because here's the truth. You don't know if there's a tomorrow. You just had two people. You're having two funerals back to back. And I heard of another one that passed away this, last night. Just heard it this morning. Tomorrow isn't promised to anyone. I got this moment 
to teach you about the one who takes care of all tomorrows. I got this moment to teach you about the one who loves. I got this moment to take you to the throne of the one who can fix everything. I got this moment to take you to the one, the only one who promises us anything, whose words are worth any value. I got this moment to tell you about the one, the only thing I get excited about, Jesus. It was Jesus who gave me my kid. I couldn't, my, my, I'm gonna say I, my wife couldn't have kids. The doctors told her there was something wrong, I'm not gonna get all into it, but do you know how bad she took it when she realized it was her and not me? And so I did the only thing I know to do. I called my pastor, I called the elders, I need to see you right now. We got together that night at the house and we anointed both of us and we prayed and in that prayer, I felt prompted to tell God, all I've ever wanted to do was be a dad, God, but if you say this isn't for me, then I, with, I withdraw what I believe is my right to be a father. I withdraw it and I'll still serve you till I die. She looked at me in prayer like, have you lost your mind? That is not what the prayer that we came to pray. Two weeks later, we go to a follow-up appointment with the doctor to go see our options, and she's super pregnant. Doctor's words, not mine. Ma'am, you are super pregnant. When it came, my baby boy comes out, and I'm looking at him with all this love, and I'm like, this is amazing, God. I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm a father. Two years go by and we look at each other and, hey, what do you think about siblings for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do what we should have did the first time. Let's talk to God about it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We go pray. God, I know the first time we prayed last, this time we're praying first. Could we have another child? Two weeks later, she's pregnant with twins. I said, hey God, I see a pattern here. <laughs> I prayed once, I got one. I prayed twice, I got two. I'm not gonna pray to you about that anymore. <laughs> Think we're done over here. I will speak of your graces forever. <laughs> I think we're done. Here's the point. When it comes to our family, when it comes to our friends, when it comes to our housing, when it comes to our finances, when it comes to the currency of heaven, which is people. Do we believe like that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We love to say that when we're being attacked, but I now love to pray it when I'm doing the attacking. I love to pray it when I'm going after the devil's kingdom. I love to pray it when I'm going after people. I love to pray it when I'm going after God's, God's children, the lost ones. Because I believe that my father is ready to come back and take his kids home. And I believe that he will do anything for the ones that are willing to go find his lost kids. Imagine that my kid gets kidnapped and somebody comes to me and says, I will help you find them. There would be no resource that they wouldn't have because I would give them everything I have to help me go find my kids. God wants us to help him bring his kids home and he wants to, our faith to do it. We must believe. Yesterday, we had the altar call for these kids. For the older kids, I played a video it's about the greatest love story ever told. It's about a father and a son playing on a train. Dad was working on a train and the kid was playing and the kid gave his life so that that train and the people on board can continue on. And the reason I wanted to play it for him because I wanted them to know that the place that Jesus wants us to take us to was chosen by God the Father. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You're gonna go to a place where you're wanted. You're gonna to go to a place where God is, can't wait to embrace you and bring you home. And I wanted the kids to see it as a culmination of everything that we went through during the week. I wanted them to, 
to feel the emotion of it. Because we always talk about what Jesus went through, but we hardly ever talk about what it cost dad. And I made the altar call. And you should have seen these eighth grade through high school kids rally up here. I don't know if there was anybody left in their seats, but they all wanted to give their life to God. They all wanted to follow Jesus. They all were saying, I want to be baptized. They all were saying, I want one of my friends to come to the faith because that was part of the call. If you've been baptized, what about your friends? Nobody likes to go to Disneyland by themselves. That's boring. We all want family and friends with us. And they came up here in droves. And even I was amazed at what God did. And then the K through, K through, uh, what is it? Six, seven came up. And I did a little different program for them. They're, they're fun. Those guys are Oh, to believe like a child. I love them. And we did K through three. Stand up if you believe in Jesus. And they stood. Raise your hand if you can't wait to go home with him. And one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen is these kids jumping and excited about Jesus coming. And then the fourth through seven, we made an altar call for them. And having gotten to know some of them all week, There's some amazing stories with these kids. Some amazing stories. But they are more than the high school. And they filled up this place all the way down the sides with wanting, having a heartfelt desire. (coughs) All right, devil, you can leave me alone. I'm wrapping up. They had a heartfelt desire to come to Christ. And so I admonish you as the body of believers that are here. You got work to do. You got a school of 250 or so kids that are ready. And they're going to be looking at you for mentorship, for guidance, for leadership on how to be a follower of Christ, how to build a relationship, how to believe what to do during the difficult times. They're just babies. It's going to take you to surround them. But you better make sure, you better make sure that your faith is solid. Because these kids are looking to us. And this generation, this COVID-19 generation, this, this iPad generation, They're not with the okie doke, they're different. They will move you aside to make sure that they get to the truth. We have a job to do. We can heal the world through Christ, but he's asking us to believe. Let's pray. Father in heaven, It's a simple thing. It's just keying in on one verse. You said because of their faith. You were looking at their faith. I don't know why I hadn't seen that before. I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before. But you healed that man, not only from his sins, but then turned around and healed his body because of their faith. And in doing so, you created some faith in someone else. That man took his bed and walked, and he will believe in you forevermore. But the linchpin was the faith of those that brought him, the faith of those who you call by your name. The linchpin was the believers. Father, I pray this prayer for all of us. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.